That's right, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to go through some things that you might not have covered yet. So I'll, I'll just try and take it slowly, but um, yeah, just be aware of that. So hopefully this will be a little bit of a primer for um, your lectures that will be coming up. Uh, so number one, our, our first question there, we have two cars traveling in a straight line um, in the same direction along a multi-lane highway in adjacent lanes. Car A starts 100 meters behind car B and both cars are initially traveling with a velocity of 20 meters per second. So we've got uh, car A and car B and there's a distance of 100 meters between the two and you want to find out Oh, so car B maintains a constant velocity while car A begins to accelerate at 2.5 meters per second. Um, and you want to find out how long, so that's time, so you want to find out how long it'll take for car A to catch up to car B. Um, so the key thing here is that both of these cars have the same initial velocity of 20 meters per second. So what's, if you think of it in terms of their relative velocity to each other, their relative velocity is zero because they're both going at the same initial velocity. So you can simplify this problem by treating them as if they're both stationary, so they both have an initial velocity of zero because it, we're only interested in their um, the velocity relative to each other, okay? So we're going to say that both of them have an initial velocity of zero meters per second and that's going to make our calculations a lot easier, okay? So then if they're both stationary, we can just say how long will it take car A to go a distance of 100 meters, okay? So then our variable d, or distance, is going to be 100 meters, okay. So, um, we are going to use uh, this equation here, so distance is equal to initial velocity multiplied by time plus half multiplied by acceleration multiplied by time squared, okay. So we know that the initial velocity is zero and anything multiplied by zero is zero. So we can, so this whole thing here would just be zero. So we can take that out of the equation. So we're just left with d is equal to half times at squared. Okay, um, so here we want to find out what time is, so we have to rearrange this equation for time, so I'll just go through that. Um, we're going to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the half, so that'll be 2d is equal to at squared. Uh, we want to get rid of the a, so we're going to divide both sides by a. So 2d divided by a is going to be equal to t squared, and then you're going to take the square root of both sides to get rid of that exponent. So then you end up with t is equal to the square root of 2d over a. Okay. So I'd recommend having these uh, pre-rearranged on your cheat sheet because uh, it's going to come out quite a bit. Okay, so now we have our equation. All we have to do is uh, substitute our numbers. Two times our distance, which is 100, over our acceleration, which is 2.5. Okay, and if you do that, the answer should be 
8.9 seconds. Okay? Any questions with that? Um, I usually try and take my time so you guys have uh, enough um, time to write things down. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. Okay, or if I'm going too slow, just let me know as well. Um, so our second question, your friend sells your, sends your cell phone sliding across uh, horizontal ice towards you at a constant velocity of 2 meters per second. Unfortunately, you don't catch it, and the ice ends at a cliff edge only 20 meters away. So it's gone past you while you're standing there. What's the minimum acceleration you'll need to save your cell phone from falling off the ice? Um, so that's assuming that you go and run after your phone towards the cliff edge. Um, so here, uh, we want to write down the variables that we've been given and the values. So our first information is our velocity of the phone. So velocity of the phone is equal to 2 meters per second. And then the distance from you to the cliff edge is 20 meters. And the piece of information, the variable that we want to find out, so this is really important. You have to identify the variable that you're looking for before, because if you don't know what you're looking for, um, there's no point looking for stuff. Okay, so the variable that we're looking for is going to be A. So A equals question mark. Okay, so that there isn't really enough information for us to figure out uh, the answer for this. Uh, but using the constant velocity and distance, we can figure out another piece of information, and that's time. So we know how we can figure out how long it'll take the phone to reach the cliff edge. Okay, so distance is equal to velocity multiplied by time, and if we make that triangle, so uh, d will go on top, v and t on the bottom. So then we want to have uh, t on its own, so that means d and v will be on the other side. So t is equal to distance divided by velocity. Our distance is 20 meters divided by our velocity, so that's going to be 10 seconds for our phone to reach the cliff edge. Okay, so now we have another piece of information, and that's our time is equal to 10 seconds. <coughs> so Oh, sorry, we do have another piece of information, and that's that um, you are, your initial velocity is going to be zero, because you, you are just standing there. Um, so your initial velocity is equal to zero. And now we can disregard the phone, because we're not interested in, interested in it anymore. <clears throat> so we've got D, A, T, and V, I. So that's the same variables that we had as the first question. So <clears throat> I like to do this, and then I can look on my cheat sheet and look for the equation that has these variables in it. Okay, And if you do that, you'll find that it's this equation, the last one that we used. So D equals V, I, T plus half A, T squared. We know that initial velocity is zero, so we can cross this out. And we're left with d is equal to half a t squared. This time we want acceleration. Yeah, we want acceleration. So <coughs> we're going to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the half. 2d is equal to a t squared. Divide both sides by t squared. And you're left with. So that's going to cancel out. So then acceleration is equal to 2d over t squared. So you've got your equation. Now we just substitute the numbers. 2 times our distance, 20 meters, over our time, which is 10 seconds. So 10 squared. So that's going to be 
uh, 0 0.4 meters per second squared. Okay, so I'll move on. Number three, a bird can fly at a maximum speed of 7.0 meters per second in still air. It flies as hard as it can, pointing north, while a wind blows at 5.0 meters per second to the east. What will be the magnitude of the bird's total velocity relative to the ground? And you want the answer in meters per second. All right, so this is a vector addition. So you've got a north pointing vector, and you've got an eastwards pointing vector. So we're going to have to add those together. So we're going to draw one vector pointing north, so we're just up in this instance. And so if this was a bird's eye view, this would be north. Uh, so the magnitude of this vector is 7.0 meters per second, but I won't write meters per second. Um, and then you want to do head to tail, so our next one is going to be start at the head of the arrow, or the vector. So this one's going to be 5.0. <clears throat> and the resultant total velocity of the bird will be if you connect the tail to the head. OK, so this will be our v total of the bird. And of course, here you can see that this is just a right angle triangle. And this side here, the length of this vector will be um, the magnitude of the velocity, which, we're, which is what we're after. So we can just use Pythagoras' theorem. So that's going to be a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So c, our, our hypotenuse, is going to be equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that's 5 squared plus 7 squared, uh, which would be 8.6 meters per second. Okay, So that means um, the length of the hypotenuse is going to be 8.6, and that's going to be our total velocity. So we have an answer of 8.6 meters per second. Okay. So you can see in this, uh, if, if you had a, a velocity going in the northeast direction, it has a vertical, it has a northwards component and it has an eastwards component. So you can break down these uh, velocities into the horizontal and the vertical components. Okay. Number four, we have a 125 meter tall skyscraper. Uh, it has a smooth, uh, no friction spiral slide. The total length is 1,000 meters and it descends to the ground. If a 100 kg man starts from rest at the top, with what speed will he leave the slide at the bottom? So uh, we're going to write down the variables that we've been given. So 125 meters tall, that's going to be our height. So h is equal to 125 meters. Um, we have a length uh, of 1,000 meters, or our distance. So we could say distance as well. Um, but you'll see that this variable here is irrelevant. So sometimes they might throw you uh, numbers that you don't actually need to use. So be careful of that. Um, we have mass, so our mass is going to be 100 kilos, and we want to find out the velocity of the man at the bottom of the slide, so that's V equals question mark. Okay, so that's, this part's really important, you always have to find out what you're looking for. Um, so, if we have a person at the top of a building, 
can't even draw a stick, man. Um, cool. So this person is, uh, is at a height of 125 meters. So when he's at this height, he has what we call gravitational potential energy. Okay. So this guy here has potential energy, PE. So it's a form of energy. And it's the equation for potential energy is mass times gravity times height. Okay? So we can calculate the amount of potential energy that this person has at the top of this slide. So we know that his mass is 100 kilograms and the value for gravity is going to be 10. So not 9.8, we just use 10 in physics 191. Makes things simpler. And our height is going to be 125. So that's going to be 125,000 joules. So energy, the unit is joules. Okay? So as he goes down the slide, his potential energy is going to be converted into another form of energy, and that's going to be kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is something that you have because you're moving. So as he goes down the slide, he's going to be going faster and faster, and that's going to mean that he's going to gain more and more kinetic energy, and that energy is coming from potential energy, because remember that you can't create or dis destroy energy. It has to come from somewhere. Okay. So at the bottom of the slide, all of this potential energy, 125,000 joules, is going to be kinetic energy. So the equation for kinetic energy is going to be uh, half times mv squared. Okay? And we just said that um, kinetic energy will be equal to our potential energy. Right? Um, so that means that uh, our kinetic energy will also be 125,000 joules. So we have the kinetic energy, we have the mass. All we have to do is rearrange this equation for velocity. So we're going to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the half. So that's 2Ke is equal to mv squared. We're going to, uh, sorry, we're going to divide both sides by m. So that's going to cancel out the m's. And then we're going to take the square root of both sides, and that'll get rid of the exponent. OK, so this one here, this equation, v equals the square root of 2ke over m, comes up a lot. So you definitely want that on your cheat sheet. OK, so v is equal to square root of 2ke over m. We're going to chuck in our numbers. 2 times 125,000 divided by our mass, which is 100. So if you do that, you should get an answer of 50 meters per second. OK? All right, so I've shown you the long version where uh, we went through all the calculations. So I just went through it, I went through it that way to um, try and illustrate to you the uh, concept of potential energy being converted into kinetic energy. Um, and the key thing here also to remember is that uh, we only know that kinetic energy was the same as potential energy because of the fact that it said there's no friction. So if there was friction, um, some of that potential energy would be lost as heat or other forms of energy, maybe sound. Um, yeah, so just keep in mind that you only have kinetic energy equal to potential energy when there's no friction, OK? If there is friction, um, then you have to calculate the amount of energy lost to friction. Um, and then subtract that from your kinetic energy. So we'll go through an example of that in the next tutorial, in the advanced class. Um, 
<coughs> so now I'd just like to show you another way that you can calculate this um, without going through a much shorter way. So I'm just going to show you some algebra here, which uh, you don't have to know, but I'll just show you just so you know. So we know that potential energy is equal to mgh. We know that kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. And we know that potential energy is equal to kinetic energy, right? So then we're going to replace so that means that mgh is equal to half mv squared. Everyone with me? Yep. So then we're going to divide both sides by m to get rid of the m. So if I divide both sides by m, that's going to get rid of the m. These cancel out. So then we're left with gh equals uh, half v squared. Multiply both sides by 2, that's 2gh um, equals v squared, because we're getting rid of the half. Uh, take the square root of both sides, so then that means that <coughs> v is equal to, <coughs> sorry, the square root of 2gh, okay? Um, <clears throat> no, so you'd use a different uh, equation, but so she just asked if um, would use a different equation if the initial velocity was not zero. Um, so you would have to uh, calculate the initial kinetic energy as well. Uh, but for most of our problems, usually they'll start from rest or have an initial velocity of zero. Yeah. Um, so. We have this simplified equation here, which is going to give us the same answer uh, as the one that the, the big calculation that we did before. So our velocity at the bottom of the slide is going to be 2 times 10, so value of gravity, times our height, which was 125 meters. So if you do that in your calculator, you'll find that it gives you the exact same value as before, 50 meters per second. So if you have a problem where a person or an object is falling from a height and their potential energy is being converted to kinetic energy and you know that there's no friction, then you can just simply use this equation here uh, and all you need to have is the height. It doesn't matter what the mass is. They're, whether it's a heavy object or light object, it's always going to have the same velocity when it hits the ground. Okay? So I'll move on. So number five, what power is needed to accelerate your one ton or 1,000 kg car along a horizontal road from rest to 90 kilometers per hour in 10 seconds, and we want that answer in kilowatts. Okay. Um, so first of all, we're going to write down the variables that we've been given. We have a mass of 1,000 kilograms. Um, we know that our initial velocity is zero meters per second, and our final velocity is equal to 90 kilometers per hour, but remember that we don't want it in kilometers per hour, we have to convert that into meters per second. So how do we do that? Does anyone remember? So, yeah, so 90 divided by 3.6. So you just do 90 divided by 3.6, and that's going to be 25. So our Final velocity is going to be 25 meters per second. Um, and our time, so they've given us a time of 10 seconds. 
And the variable that we want to find is going to be power. So power equals question mark. OK, so now if we look at our cheat sheet or our equations uh, for power, you'll find that one of the equations is power is equal to energy over time. OK, so we have the time here, but we don't have the energy. But if a car is moving at 25 meters per second, what sort of energy does it have? Yep, kinetic energy, right? So kinetic energy is just a form of energy. So we can calculate the amount of kinetic energy that it must have when it's going at 25 meters per second. So kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. So that's going to be half times our mass, which is 1,000, times our velocity, which is 25, so 25 squared. And that's going to give you a value of um, 312,500 joules. Remember that energy is in joules. OK, so now we have the value of our energy. So we're going to replace E with 312,500 divided by our time, which is 10 seconds. Um, so I'll just bring that down here, sorry. So power will be equal to uh, 31,250 watts. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I should have explained power. So power is um, the rate of energy use. So if you see there, power is equal to energy over time. So the unit of energy is time, uh, sorry, the unit of energy is joules. And the unit of time is seconds. So that's basically joules per second, right? And we don't say joules per second, we say watts. So one watt is one joule per second. When you see those 40 watt light bulbs at the supermarket, that means it uses 40 joules per second. Uh, and if you have a 100 uh, watt light bulb, then it's using 100 joules of energy every second. Okay? So what, uh, power is a measure of the rate of energy use. So this means that uh, the engine has to produce 31,250 joules of energy per second, or watts, um, in order for us to reach that velocity in 10 seconds. Okay? And remember that we want our answer to be in kilowatts, so we're going to um, add a prefix, right? So we're just going to divide it by a prefix, so k, our prefix, is times 10 to the, oh, sorry, is times 10 to the 3, or 1,000. So we're just going to divide that by 1,000, and that's going to give us 31.25 kilowatts. Oh, sorry, 31, yeah, 31, yeah, 31.25. So uh, E, 31. Number six, you and a friend are holding a heavy uniform plank of wood with a mass of 60 kilograms and a length of six meters. Your friend is holding the plank at one end while you are holding the plank some distance from the other end. Your friend's exerting an upward force of 200 newtons and the plank is stationary and horizontal. How far from your end are you holding the plank? And we want that in meters. Okay, so. Uh, we have people uh, exerting force on this plank from various ends, and so you can sort of tell that this is going to be a torque question. Um, as you get more familiar with the questions, 
uh, you'll kind of figure out what sort of question it is a lot faster, but this, is, this one's going to be a talk question. So also in the hint, they say the fulcrum, so that's going to be a big hint that it's going to be about talk. Okay, so you guys haven't had the talk lecture yet, right? Oh, you have? Okay, cool. Um, so I won't explain talk, hopefully you guys already understand it, but basically it's just about uh, rotation. So um, like uh, if you have a seesaw um, and you have a 10 kg object right at the end and then a 10 kg object halfway um, closer to the fulcrum on this point, which side's going to have more torque? This side, right? Because it's farther from the fulcrum. So torque is equal to force times distance, right? So this is this force will be um, going down in this direction, right? So this is clockwise, whereas this force, uh, this force here will be going downwards. So that's counterclockwise. Um, so let's just say that this was um, two meters, while this here is only one meter. So our torque would be equal to so. The force of a 10 kg object is force equals mass times gravity. So 10 times gravity, which is 10. So that's 100 newtons times 2. So we'd have a torque of 200 newton meters. Um, and then on this side, our torque would be force times distance again. Uh, and it's the same amount of force, so 100. Uh, but this time our distance is only one, so you can see that our torque is only half the amount it is on the other side. So what would end up happening is that this seesaw would uh, go down this way and it would rotate in a clockwise direction. Okay, so that's pretty uh, basic. So I thought I'd go over that just to make it perfectly clear. So in our problem, uh, whenever we have a torque problem, I like to draw a diagram uh, so that I can see what's going on. Um, so we have our plank here, and we know, so the keyword there, it's uniform. So we know that it's symmetrical, and that means that the 60 kg weight force is going to act at the center of gravity, which will be right in the middle of this plank. So, our downwards weight force, so Fw, will be equal to, uh, so 60 kg, weight force is equal to mass times gravity, which is uh, 60 kilos times 10. So that's 600 newtons, right? So that's the weight of the plank downwards. And our friend is exerting an upwards force of 200 newtons at one end of the plank. So that's the force from the friend. Um, actually, I'll just call that F1. So F1, uh, that's equal to 200 newtons. And then it says that you're exerting a force. Uh, so force. force me, uh, but we don't know what that force is. We haven't been told how much force we're exerting on the plank upwards, right? And what we want to find out is the distance from my end of the plank 
Okay, so we want to know this distance here. Okay, so before we go on, we have to figure out what this force is going to be, because otherwise we're going to have too many variables. So remember that um, if it's stationary, our torque clockwise is going to be equal to our torque counterclockwise, which means that F1 D1 is equal to F2 D2. So if we had three variables, we could figure out the fourth variable. But in this case, we only have two of the variables, and we don't know um, our third variable. So we can actually figure it out. Um, they haven't told us directly, but we have enough information to figure out how much this force is going to be. So we've been told that this plank is stationary, so it's not accelerating downwards. Right, so in the vertical plane, there's no uh, acceleration downwards or upwards. That means that our vertical net force must be equal um, to zero newtons because that means that the upwards and the downwards forces cancel out. So let's just forget about torque for a moment. And you've got a box here, and it's 60 kilograms. And you know that there's going to be a downwards force of 600 newtons. And we have an upwards force of 200 newtons, right? So in order for the upwards and downwards force to cancel out, how much more force do we need? 400, right? So that must be how much force I'm exerting. So we figured out how much force I'm exerting. So this force here is 400 newtons. So 600 newtons down and 600 newtons up. OK, so when we try and figure out our torque problems, uh, you can put your fulcrum wherever you want it to. So the fulcrum is the point around which everything rotates. Uh, we could put it here, or we could put it here. So the question recommends that we use our fulcrum at this point here, where our friend is. So let's put it there. But you can also put it here and get the same answer. So it doesn't matter where you put the fulcrum. It's just a matter of uh, where you find it the most convenient. And um, it's usually good to put it uh, at a point where you can eliminate one of the forces because that's going to make your calculation simpler. So in this case, and that's so if we put our fulcrum right at the end where our friend is exerting their force, um, what's the distance from the fulcrum to the force exerted by their friend? It's zero, right? So zero force times distance. Uh, if distance is zero, that means that we can get rid of uh, we can disregard this part, um, this component of the torque. Okay, so all we're concerned about now is this force and this force, right? So, uh, which one of these two forces here is the clockwise uh, force? The weight force, right? So this one here, this one's going this way. So this is going to be clockwise, and this force here the force that I'm exerting is going to be upwards, so in this direction, counterclockwise. So force one is going to be 600 times our distance. So what's our distance from our fulcrum to our weight force? Three meters, right? Because this is exactly in the midpoint, and our our plank is six meters long, so we know that this must be three meters, right? So 600 times three is equal to force two, which is my force, and we know that's 400 times our distance, which we don't know. So if we calculate this side, that's 1800. 1800 is equal to 400 
D, and then divide both sides by 400. So that's going to give you D is equal to 4.5 meters. Okay? So if you look at your options, that's not one of the answers, is it? Because where is this distance from? It's from the fulcrum, right? So we've just figured out it's 4.5 meters from the fulcrum to where we are exerting our force. So this is 4.5 meters. We know that the length of the plank is 6 meters. So our answer must be 1.5 meters. OK? All right, so number seven, um, a 100 kg man leaps horizontally from a building with a speed of five meters per second onto a 200 kg unanchored wooden platform sitting at rest on horizontal ice three meters below. Uh, with what speed will the man and platform move across the ice? Um, so here, uh, what you have is a collision. So it might not be written as a collision, but this man is jumping onto a platform, and then the man and the platform move together. So you can treat this like a sticky, inelastic collision. Have you, did you guys have the lecture on like momentum? Oh, you haven't. OK. Um, sorry. So uh, momentum is how much is a measure of how much something wants to keep moving. OK? So that's like the simple way of explaining it. Um, so if you think of a, of a bike versus a big truck, if they're both going at the same speed, which one is harder to stop? The big truck, right? Because it has more mass. So our, the symbol for momentum is P, and the equation is mass times velocity. So if both the bike and the truck have the same velocity, but the truck has a much larger mass, so it has a lot, much larger momentum, which means that it wants to keep moving a lot more. Uh, but then what about a bullet? So a bullet has a really small mass, but it has a really high velocity, right? So that's also really hard to stop. So it has a lot of momentum, right? So you can either be, so momentum uh, is a function of both mass and velocity. So either the bigger you are or the faster you're moving, the more momentum you'll have. Okay? Um, and the key thing is that when, you, uh, when two objects collide, the total momentum uh, that was there before the collision is there after the collision. So that's what we mean when we say that momentum is conserved. Okay? So if you have a collision between two objects, so we're going to keep it simple and just uh, just think of two object collisions for now. Um, yeah, I think in physics 101 you only have to worry about two object collisions. So there are two types of collisions. There are elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. So in elastic collisions, Um, kinetic energy is conserved and, and momentum is conserved. In inelastic collisions, only momentum is conserved. OK, so that's the key difference. And <coughs> so an el elastic collision is an example of like maybe like two bowling balls uh, bouncing off each other. So most of the kinetic energy or their velocity will be conserved. Whereas if you had two sponges 
uh, bouncing into each other, they're going to lose a lot of their velocity straight away. So that means their kinetic energy is lost. And, but you still maintain, you still conserve that momentum. Okay? And if two objects stick together, that's an example of a sticky inelastic collision. So in our, in our question here, we've got the man and the platform sticking together. So that's an example of a sticky inelastic collision. And like I said, the total momentum before the collision is going to be equal to the total momentum after the collision. So P initial before the collision is going to be equal to the final momentum after the collision. So which components, so we, we have, before the collision we have two separate objects. We have the man and the platform. So each of those objects are going to have their own momentum. So our initial momentum is going to be made up of and remember that uh, our momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So first we're going to look at the man before the collision. So the mass of the man uh, so yeah, the mass of the man multiplied by the velocity of the man uh, plus the mass of the platform multiplied by the velocity of the platform before the collision. So the mass of the man was 100 kilograms. And multiply that by the velocity, which was 5, plus the mass of the platform, which was 200, times the velocity, which was 0. So remember your bed, uh, remember your bed mass. So you do your multiplication first. So uh, 100 times 5, that's going to be 500, plus 200 times 0, so 200 times 0 is just 0, so we don't even need to have that there. So if you knew that the velocity was 0, you wouldn't even uh, need to put in this part here because you know that it'll have no momentum. But I've just put that in there so I could, uh, for like completeness. Uh, so we know that the initial, mom initial total momentum was 500 kg meters per second, so that's the units for momentum. Uh, and we said that initial momentum is equal to final momentum, so this value here must be also equal to our final momentum. Okay? And after the, after the collision, uh, we only have one object, so that's the man and the platform stuck together. Okay, so that's going to make things easy. So our final momentum is equal to the mass of the man and the platform multiplied by the velocity of the man and the platform. Okay, so the mass of the man and the platform together, that's 100 plus 200, so 300 kilograms times the velocity, which is what we're looking for, right? So we don't know that, so we'll just leave that as V. And we know that the final momentum was 500. So 500 is equal to 300 V. Divide both sides by 300. So V is equal to 500 over 300. And that gives you an answer of 1.67 meters per second. Or you could just say 1.7. 1.7 meters per second. Okay? So hopefully I haven't gone through that too quickly for you. Um, yeah. All right. So our next one is the pendulum. We want to find out the length of a simple pendulum with a period of two seconds. Uh, so I don't think you've had this lecture yet. Um, so whenever you have a pendulum, uh, you have this equation here. So T is for the period, so how long it takes for it to do one complete back and forth. So that's uh, a capital T for our period. And that's going to be equal to 2 pi 
multiplied by the square root of the length divided by gravity. So our period capital T is equal to 2 pi multiplied by the square root of length over gravity. Okay, and here um, we want to uh, we want to solve for length, right? So this one's a bit a bit of a hard one to rearrange, so I'll just give you the final rearranged version. So L, our length, is equal to um, T over 2 pi squared multiplied by G. Okay, so you should have that on your cheat sheet as well. Okay, so that means that our period our, uh, was 2 seconds, and that's over 2 pi squared times our gravity, which is 10. So if you put that in your calculator, you should get an answer of 1.01, .01, which will just be 1.0 seconds. Okay, so you can see how this will come in useful, having these uh, rearranged equations, uh, because if you were in the exam and you were trying to rearrange for the length here, it'd be quite tricky. And I'm sure some of you could do it, but a lot of us couldn't. Okay, so I'll rub that off the board. Uh, so this one here, number nine, uh, this is quite a tricky one. Everyone gets quite confused on these ones with the, the paired forces, action, reaction, uh, um, paired forces. So hopefully I can break it down for you and help you understand. So we have a 10 kg child pushing a 2 kg toy trolley along a gravel path. Uh, the child's exerting a constant horizontal force on the handle of the trolley. There's a 10 newton friction force on the trolley the child and the trolley are both accelerating at 0 0.5 meters per second squared. What's the magnitude of the frictional force exerted by the ground on the child's feet? Okay, so, first of all, I'll just draw the trolley. So here's my beautiful trolley. Um, so we know that it's, the mass is equal to two kilograms. Okay, and we know that it's accelerating at positive 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of net force? There's going to be a net force on the trolley, right? So we can calculate the net force that will be on this trolley. So net force is equal to mass times acceleration which is 2 kg times 0 0.5 so that the net force on this trolley is 1 Newton. So we know that there's a, a net force okay so the net force is after everything has been cancelled out, okay? So what have we also been told about the trolley? There's a 10 Newton friction force on the trolley. So if the trolley is going this way, which direction is friction going to act? In the opposite direction, right? So there's going to be a friction force acting backwards. So F friction, that's equal to 10 Newtons, okay? So if this was the only force acting on it, it would have a net force of 10 Newtons backwards. But that's not the case, is it? The net force is 1 Newtons in the positive direction. So that means that there must be another force pushing it forwards, and the magnitude 
of that force must be one newton greater than the magnitude of the force acting backwards because we know that our net force is one newton, right? One newton positive. So this means that this force going forwards is going to be 11 newtons, right? So 11 minus 10 is going to be equal 1. And where is this force going to be coming from? The child, right? So this is the force from the child on the trolley. And that's going to be equal to 11 newtons. OK, so we figured out the trolley. Now we're going to figure out the forces that are acting on the child. So oops. So this is my beautiful human here. Um, <coughs> so this child here is 10 kilograms, right? So we know that they're uh, 10 kg and their acceleration is equal to positive 0 0.5 meters per second squared. OK, just like the trolley. And we know we can figure out the, the net force that must be acting on this child by using mass times acceleration. So our mass was 10 kilograms multiplied by the acceleration, 0 0.5. So we know that our net force on the child must be 5 newtons, OK? So net force So that's the net force after everything has been cancelled out. OK, so we know that the child was exerting a force of 11 newtons on the trolley. So how much force will the trolley be exerting on the child? 11 newtons, right? Because this is an action-reaction pair force. So whatever force the child is exerting on the trolley, the trolley will exert on the boy, or, or sorry, on the child in the opposite direction. So we know that there's going to be I'll just get this out of the way. So we know that there's going to be a backwards force from the trolley of 11 newtons. So this is the force from the trolley on the child, which is equal to, equal to 11 newtons. OK? Now, um, <clears throat> so that means that on the child, so far we know that there's a backwards force of 11 newtons, but the net force is going to be 5 newtons. So whatever force is acting forwards on the child must be 5 newtons greater than this backwards force. So what's 11 plus 5? 16 newtons. So the forwards force on the child must be 16 newtons, right? So where is this forwards force coming from? So we have the ground. So this is the ground. The child is going to push with his feet into the ground and backwards. So the child is pushing backwards on the ground with a magnitude of 16 newtons. So then the ground pushes back on the child with a magnitude of 16 newtons. So the, pair, the paired forces here is between the child and the ground. So, and because there is friction between the ground and the child's feet, that's how we can, uh, that's how the ground can exert a force of 60 newtons in the forward direction. Okay? So does everyone understand that? Yeah. So what's the opposite, uh, sorry, what's, so we have a pair between the ground and the child, and also we have a pair between um, 
the child and the trolley, okay? So it's a bit complicated, uh, but hopefully that cleared things up. I'll just go through this another way. So I kind of explained it the long way so you guys could understand. But in the actual exam, I'd probably solve it this way, uh, which is a bit easier. Um, so we know that the trolley and the child are one object because they're moving together. They have the same acceleration. So we can just treat this uh, child and trolley as one 12 kg object. We know that, um, so then we can calculate the net force on it because we know that the acceleration is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. The net force is equal to uh, 12 times uh, 0 0.5, which is equal to 6 newtons. So we know that the net force, uh, force net, is equal to 6 newtons, right? And we know that there's a 10 newton, we know that there's a friction force of 10 newtons. So there must be a forward acting force that's 6 newtons greater than the backwards acting force because we know that the net force is going to be 6 newtons positive. So that means that our forwards force must be 16 newtons, which is coming from the ground and pushing us forward due to friction. Okay? Um, so that's time for uh, this session. I'll post the answers for the rest um, on, the, on the page. So is everyone... so? We've got a Facebook page for our Physics 191 tutorials. Uh, so make sure you guys are on that page because I'll be ha posting my worksheets and also recording my tutorials so you can watch them later. Okay? Cheers. So, and then in 10 minutes' time, we're going to start the advanced uh, mechanics tutorial. Okay? So stick around for that if you're not too tired. Cheers.